Hello everybody, good afternoon and welcome back to Hidden Treasures, live from the Natural History Museum in London. I'm your host Connor and I've managed to find myself in the tank room, which is where part of our fish collection is stored here at the Natural History Museum. We're down here and we're live for the next 20 minutes and this series is Hidden Treasures in which we take you behind the scenes of the most exciting areas of the museum on the first Friday of every month. And because we're live, you get to choose where we go and what we see. So make sure your comments and your questions come through on the live chat. I've got my phone here so I can keep track of what you want to see. There's over 80 million specimens in the museum, but only a small fraction of those are on display for a normal visit. So this is your chance to get to check out some really, really cool and interesting stuff. And best of all, we're also going to be joined by a museum scientist that works down here. So we're going to meet them in just a moment. So if you have any questions for them, please keep those coming through as well. There's also a live poll in the chat in which you get to decide where we go for the next episode. So that's going out on September the 2nd, that's a Friday, the same time, 3.30 p.m. BST. And you've got two choices. We've got the mammal collection and we've got the plant collection as well. So the choice is yours where we head to next. And if there's anything that you really like the look of in here and you kind of want to check out in person, you can book a behind the scenes tour of the entire spirit collection on the museum websites. There should be a link for the chat in the chat coming through very soon. But I think it's time to meet the scientists down here. So let's go and meet them. You can see we're just absolutely surrounded by some really, really weird things in jars. I can't wait to figure out what's in these. Make sure you get your suggestions and your comments coming through. But for now, this is James. How are you doing, James? Hi, Connor. How are you doing? All right. I'm doing great, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, James works down here. What, what exactly do you do? Um, my job, really, is to help look after all this stuff that you can see around you, all these fish specimens. I look after them, make sure they're in good condition, make sure they've got the right information with them. And anybody who wants to use a fish for any purpose, scientific, artistic, um, I'm here to help with that. Right, so are there, are there many people that want to come and check out the fish? Oh, loads and loads of people. I mean, mainly it's scientists, people who are describing new species, species of books, species of fish, and uh, who want to compare something they found with one of our right. things, but also all kinds of other people as well. Some of these fish have even been used as sort of props in Hollywood films to film Paddington. Um, those specimens oh. there were all in the background when Paddington ran That's down so there. cool. That's actually one of my favourite movies. Right. I didn't know that. That's really, really cool. How many, how many specimens do we have in here, approximately? So in this room, with the, it's not all fish. There are some other things in here as well, but it's mostly fish. I think we've got about 7,000 jars, and then in the tanks we've got um, a few more hundred bigger things as well. So okay. Right, so there's stuff inside of these as well, right? That's so cool. Right, I think we should probably check out some specimens up top. We've already got a comment through from KM who'd like to see some aquatic mammal specimens. We can probably check those out on a future episode because we're, we're here to see fish, it's aren't fish we? Today, yeah. yes. So get your questions in for fish, but of course we would lo we'd love to check that stuff out in a future episode. Um, I think it'd be good to start with that weird <laughs> thing there. What's yeah, this? Um, this is one of my personal favourites, this specimen. This is a, a kind of deep sea anglerfish called a football fish. Right. And this is a really nice example. I guess it's called a football fish because it, it's sort of vaguely brown and leathery, a bit of a deflated football. But, oh. uh, <laughs> but yeah, she's a real beauty. This is so, if we were a thousand meters under the sea where a fish like this might live, yeah. all we would see in the darkness would be lots of little blue points of light right. from her lure that she waves around like that. And that sort of attracts the prey over. And then when they get close enough, she will sort of sense them moving around and then grab them. So how, how do they actually glow? They, they're really clever. They've managed to um, use another kind of organism to, use to, to make their light. So what they do is, as they develop, they acquire these yeah. little tiny bioluminescent bacteria. And they sort of give the bacteria a home and food. And in return, they get to use the bacteria as light. Wow. That's so cool. So that, that answers your question. We had a question from Lizzie saying, what's the big blobby orange thing in a jar? I think that was <laughs> the big blobby orange yes. thing in a jar. Um, I did see that you moved something off the top of the jar oh, when you yes. moved it. Um, what's that thing? So that thing is also a football fish, but this is the really bizarre thing about deep sea anglerfish. The males and females are very, very different. Right. So that one in there is a female. Yeah. And that little tiny thing there is the male. It's fully the same. grown. It's a it? fully grown adult male. And what they've done is they've got this very bizarre mating strategy where the males have got very, very small. And they depend on the females here. They attach themselves like little parasites. 
And in this species, they attach for a while, they have a few babies together, right. and then the male will let go and try and find another female. But in some, like this, uh, this one in here, yeah. I think it's called a bearded sea devil. You'll see why in a minute. Yeah. That's the, the lovely beard. So this one, the, the male, there he is there. Yeah. And this species, I think he attaches permanently. Oh and in some of the most extreme <laughs> examples in other species, the male attaches the skin of the female sort of yeah. grows over his face and he gets partially oh absorbed. Goodness. And look at the teeth on that. It's yeah, well. I mean, it's... It yeah. must be a struggle being a deep sea fish. Um, so we've actually got a question here from Hannah, mm -hmm. who asks, how many years can specimens be preserved in these jars? Oh, that's a great question. So we preserve everything here in alcohol, yeah. and that is a great preservative. We have things that have been preserved in alcohol since the oldest ones, we think, are from about 1730, so nearly what, 300 years old. Wow. Um, <laughs> and they, they lose a bit of color over time. That's something that we refine, but the actual structure remains really good, so they're, right. they're pretty much as as fresh as they went in. That's so cool. Um, I think it'd be great if we could take a look inside of one of these big tanks. Sure, let's do that one there. Okay, cool, yeah. Maybe if we head around this way, James. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, meet you there. Right, so let's so have I'm a look inside of this thing. So I'm gonna lift up the lid and we'll move it that way there. Right. Um, maybe raise it a bit more. If you could get that bit there and uh, turn it and out yep. that's it. Okay. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's pretty big. Yeah, so all the things that are too big to go in a jar, we put in a tank. Right. And as you can see, it would uh, there's, be quite a job getting either of these things into a jar. Yeah. So I'll see if I can get yeah. <laughs> So what are they? So these are two of the most notorious sharks. Uh, this is, these are great white sharks. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, I have to be quite careful here. Yeah, but it's got really, really sharp teeth. Very sharp teeth. And it has these very, very distinctive oh teeth. They're very broad and triangular. Yeah. And if you hear... They have, oh. little, they have little serrations, little teeth on their teeth. And those are teeth that are just designed for tearing great big chunks of flesh off things. So, uh, oh my goodness. If you have any questions about sharks, James is your person, so make sure those are coming through. There's, there's another one in here. We'll so yeah, this one is even bigger. Take a look at that. That is absolutely, that's mad. How big can these things get? So this is about, I think, 3.2 meters, but a fully grown adult can be almost double that length. I think up to six and a half is the record. So if you imagine twice as big as that, yeah. and fat as well, they're really <laughs> huge animals. That's fantastic. And so wh where, whereabouts in the world did, did these live? So these ones are from South, um, South Africa. Okay. But uh, they're, they're found all over the place. Right. And uh, the, I think they've even been recorded in the Bay of Biscay. So, oh, wow. And they used to be in the Mediterranean as well, so they're found quite a lot. But they're, sadly, their numbers in a lot of these populations aren't as many as they used to be. Yeah. But they're making a bit of a comeback in the sort of south, southern oceans, I believe. Which is, is, there, good. is there like a, what's the reason why they're kind of dipping in terms of numbers? And they're maybe making a comeback as well. Well, I think the, the comeback is because they're now protected areas where right. they can sort of go through their life cycles and, uh, and the young can sort of grow up. Because I think the main thing that was affecting them was overfishing. Right. And uh, certain fishing methods that catch um, sharks as well as the target fish. Right, yeah. Because they're absolutely magnificent animals, aren't they? They are, they're, yes. <laughs> I mean, in, a, in, a, in their own way, they are, they're quite gorgeous, aren't they? They're just so huge. Um, that is really cool. I think it'd be great maybe if we take a look at some of the, the, the jars in the background because there's just so much to explore. So maybe if we head down sure. here and we go around the corner. Okay. I mean, we have another set of shark jaws here. Oh, yeah, we can take a look at those. Quick. I think people watching along are liking the sharks, so. <laughs> so th this is from a shark that was oh, probably goodness. about six meters long. Right. And uh, yeah, you can really see what I mean about these, these huge, big cutting teeth with right. the, the serrations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also you can see the replacement teeth. So all the while this, this shark is, 
uh, alive, it will have new teeth forming at the back here, and like a sort of conveyor belt, they move oh. forward. And when these ones get a bit broken or blunt, they just fall off, and then the next tooth just comes over like that. So it's got a continual supply of sharp teeth all through its life. Wow. Um, we have a question through from KM who asks, are fish hard to taxidermy, or are they easier to preserve in alcohol? Um, you can do it. Sharks aren't good. Mm -hmm. um, stuffed sharks always look a bit ropey. Okay. Um, but um, you, it's, you much prefer preserving things in alcohol. Yeah. You get much more information by preserving the whole thing rather than just, just the skin and the outside. But we do, well, they used to do it in the olden days. Yeah. yeah. And while we're talking about sharks, Charlie has been asking, do we have an example of British sharks in here at all? Yes, we do. Um, Let's see if we can find we one. Go around here. Okay. Um, so there are three, four heads here oh, wow. of a, a shark oh, that is quite actually... Literally. So this is a, a quite a close relative of the, the great white shark. Uh, it's in the same family. And these are called poor beagle sharks. Um, but there, if you look, you can see they've actually got quite different shaped teeth. So the, these teeth are much more sort of spiky and pointy. And that tells you that's a shark that primarily eats fish. Right. Those are teeth that are really good at sort of grabbing something that's trying to get away really quickly. And they don't have those little, um, those little serrations or those little... No, the serrations are really for cutting through stuff. But if you right. want to sort of grab something quickly, then you go for like a much more spiky tooth. Right, okay. I actually see, I see your name <laughs> on that jar there. So what's that all about? Uh, so th this is a, a, a little shark. I think it was a, an aquarium mortality. And I uh, remember this, this, this came in in 2006. And a friend of mine was going to feed it to some flesh-eating beetles to see the skeleton. And I said, no, no, please don't do that. It's so nice. Yeah. Uh, so I rescued it and uh, uh, I don't identified it and put it in that jar. So oh, amazing. So yeah. people can study that. Yeah. 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 That's that's really, really amazing. And I see also um, while we're over here, there's a really strange looking is that a hammerhead shark? Yeah, right and here? this is quite an old specimen by the look of it. Um, let's see if I can uh, 1872 that was pickled. Wow. Um, and that can Makassar. Um, and this jar would probably have been made specially for that specimen. There used to be a museum glass blower back in the Victorian era who would make jars of, if you had a specimen that came in that was a funny shape, right. they'd actually make a jar for you here. Huh. Yeah, because um, that one's a bit wider, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm just going to show you the head there, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it has all through the underside of this, the sort of like the hammer bit, it's got lots of little sensory organs called the amp. Pule of Lorenzi, I think. Oh, wow. And with those, it, they're, they're incredibly clever. With those, it can basically smell electricity. So it can detect very, very faint electrical currents. So every time um, a muscle is moving, there are little bits of yeah. electricity that move up and down it. And this is so sensitive that it can actually detect the beating heart of a fish buried wow. in the sand. So that's the sort of thing that they like to eat. They like to eat flatfish and stingrays and things that are buried. So they can sort of swim over the sand, sort of scanning it as they go. So and then they like can a metal detector. Exactly. Like, exactly. Kind of yes. Scanning. That's so cool. I didn't know that. Um, oh, we've got we've got loads of fantastic questions. Uh, so obviously we had some sharks over there from South Africa. Hannah asks, how do you transport sharks to the museum, and how come they're not decaying on the, along the way? So they have to be frozen. So right. anything big that comes in, we, we freeze it, and then when it comes here, we defrost it, and then do the preservation stage. Right. Of it. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And also, Emily asks, what's your favourite specimen in the collection? Oh. And I guess, could we see it if it's um, in I yours? think you've already have seen it. I think okay. that, that football fish, the big round, <laughs> yeah. that, that yeah, is yeah, probably yeah. my favourite specimen. I think it's Maybe if we had some more kind of deep sea fish, we could There's check those out. There's some more angler fish up here. Yeah, yeah we could check those out. Um, yeah, keep the questions coming. These are fantastic. Um, so, Lemon Basil's daughter asks, what's the most ugly fish? that you have. <laughs> well, I mean, that's pretty weird looking, isn't it? Oh, yeah. That, that's, uh, um, they call them chimeras. And it's got a very, very long, pointy nose. And it also has the same thing as I was describing in the shark earlier. It's got all these little holes that help oh. it sort of detect um, electricity. And that one's got it. This is a similar kind of thing, but without the really long nose. Mm. I'm to Why does it have that long nose? Um, I guess it probably gives it more room to have little sensors, but then as to why that one hasn't done the same thing, mm. I don't know. We've got a question from Josh asking if we've got any eels. We do have some eels. Look, here's oh, some right, right here. here. Perfect. Um, there are some moray eels in there. 
And again, they look pretty, uh, not too old, 1914. And there's a huge uh, eel in one of these. I mean, you've seen on that old, but that is so over 100 years still. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I will see it. Oh, there's that. I thought that was an eel, but that's actually a lungfish. All oh, right. The, the fascinating thing about this is that the, the pattern is still there. Yeah. That's really cool. So one of the things you have to be really aware of when you're storing specimens is to not expose them to too much light, especially sunlight. Right. Uh, that will make a specimen go completely pale. Okay. So if you keep them in, so when we're not in this room, it's quite dark in here. And so things like these color patterns, can, uh, you can keep them for quite a long time, hopefully. Right, right. Um, James has asked, um, what's the newest specimen in here? And also the oldest, whichever one might be um, easy. We've got some quite new things over here. OK. Um, I'm just trying to think. So the, the, the absolute newest things that we've just got in were the things I was looking at when you came in. Right, yeah. So there was a, a Gobi researcher who retired and has given us all his gobies. So at the moment, we're just sort of sorting through them. Um, well, there's a good anglerfish. So that's, okay. that's the biggest kind of anglerfish. That's a thing called a warty sea devil. Yep. Um, but like all the other anglerfish, the male is very small. And that, that blob thing there, that's the male. Oh and that one was taken from the stomach of a whale, which is why it looks a oh, bit... What kind of whale would eat them? Uh, sperm like whales eat them. Oh, I think they prefer wow. giant squid, but I think if they come across other things moving around, they go for those as well. These are really gnarly looking. And so that, that's, that's the male there. That's the male, and, and this is the species where the male kind of completely fuses with mm. the female. We actually had a question through from Tahir who asked how, ma how many species of anglerfish does that happen in? Is it a common thing? So in, in the deep sea ones, the ones that live below 1,000 meters that live in the, sort of in the middle of the water, those are the ones that do it. The ones that live on the seabed tend not to do it. So for example, this is a, an anglerfish from a much more shallow habitat, and that lives on the seabed. Right. And you can usually tell a fish that leave, lives on the seabed because it's gone flat. <laughs> and uh, so this one still has the, the lure, and you can see a bit of it there. Right. But it doesn't glow because it still lives in an area where there's quite a lot of natural light. So that will sort of have a, a lure with a little flap of skin, mm. and it will flick it about. And some of them have really cool lures that are like wiggling worms, and <laughs> they're, they're really quite sort of elaborate. Anything yeah. to, uh, to lure in the prey, right? Yeah. It's, it, on this one here... Are, are those like both eyes right next to each um, other? Or is, what's, what's going on? <laughs> it just really it caught my eye, to be honest. It's really weird. I think it's, that one doesn't look. Some things are easier to put nicely into a jar than okay. other things. And that looks like it's been kind of folded up a bit. Right. Because um, this is like quite an old jar as well. Yeah, that's by another the labels. Um, museum glassware job, I think. The, right. the saddest one is that one there. Okay. So this yeah. is an absolutely beautiful fish. Um, called a, an oar fish, and they yeah. get to be really um, sort of six meters long. Um, but again, it's hard to put a six meter long thing in a jar, so this one has been kind of cut into right. segments. That's absolutely huge if that was actually fully articulated. So occasionally we do get it out to <laughs> lay it out with all the yeah. bits lined up. Wow. Um, so Imran has asked if we can show a, a fish brain, or if not, Anything you can tell us about fish brains, like any cool facts? Oh, um, <laughs> I know quite a nice one about yeah. fish brains. So there is a deep sea fish, which has the unfortunate name of the bony-eared ass fish. Don't ask me okay. why. I think it's ass as in donkey. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, there, there's a very nice eel that just caught me. Oh, that's, there's, there's yeah, that is really nice. Um, but this fish lives in an environment, you know, thousands of meters down. And when you live in an environment like that where there's not a lot of food, you have to make sort of cuts. And one of the most expensive organs in any body is the brain, especially mm -hmm. in humans. We have to use a lot of energy just to keep our brains working. So a lot of these deep sea fish have economized on their brain. So they are probably the stupidest of all fish. They have the brains that just do the absolute most basic stuff. So they can, enough to sort of smell to find their food and enough to make them eat it, maybe to avoid something that's bad and then nothing else. So it's almost like a, a computer program, yeah. just like really basic, yeah. So yeah, a lot of the deep sea things are probably have the smallest brains. Right. Uh, we're coming up towards the end of our time here. We've got an interesting question through from James saying, uh, not you. Uh, why are there so many uh, things kept in cylindrical containers even when the creatures are really big? So I'm guessing kind of talking about the orphan. I think thing. that's just the simplest kind of jar to get. I think right. if you want a jar that's rectangular or, or sort of a different shape, it's much more complicated to make yeah. them. 
So the kind of jars that we can easily buy and that are the, the sort of the cheapest are always the cylindrical ones. Right, right, okay. I think maybe we've got time to fit in one more specimen in this area. Do you want to you pick one out for um, us? I don't know if there's any fishermen watching, but we occasionally get um, people who've caught like a, a British record, which is the biggest fish of some species caught off Britain. And uh, I, I'm sure people will be familiar with a sea bass. Yeah. Um, this is the biggest sea bass ever caught off Britain. Oh, wow. That so the ones you see in the huge. fish shop are usually about this big, and this one, I think, weighed 26 pounds, caught by Mr. Steve Cave, I think it was, yeah. You see the Isle of Wight as well. That's amazing. Oh, thank you so much no, for sharing pleasure. these. Pleasure. Uh, I think that's pretty much all we have time for, though, today. So thank you for putting aside some time. I know you're a very busy person. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having us. No problem, Connor. All the best. <laughs> All right. Thanks, James. And thank you, everyone, for watching along at home. I'm sorry we didn't get through to every single question there. Um, we can definitely follow them up in the live chat. And also, uh, we've got many more episodes about different areas of the museum coming up, too. So remember that there is a poll in the live chat for, so you can decide where we go to in the next episode. Next episode is happening on Friday, uh, the 2nd of September, at the same time, 3.30. Uh, and you've got two choices, the mammal collection and the plants collection. So make sure you vote for that. And if you liked this, definitely subscribe to the, the YouTube channel for the Natural History Museum because we've got tons of great content that you'll also enjoy. So make sure you press that subscribe button. But thank you so much for everyone who's joined us. Thank you so much for your questions. And we'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.